work started on the agriculture with me uh, from one uh, small project by uh, Department of Farmers and Agriculture, well, uh, Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Government of Haryana. So they gave one uh, project that uh, they were facing uh, in making connection with the farmers. So how to motivate the farmers about various schemes and how to bring in the best practices like that. And there are many schemes like uh, Pradhan Mantri, uh, Fasal Bhima Yojana, and so on, and which they were not uh, very, you can say, aware of. So that started with this note, and uh, we formed one team of our uh, students only. And within two, three months, we formed one platform. And that platform uh, is known as Digital Kisan on the Facebook that you will find that is uh, still available. And we uh, made the, our students uh, basically took the effort and made small, small videos which they can uh, you can share uh, with the farmers. And there's two minutes video, three minutes video. So one team was uh, you know focused on finding out who was using the best practices in one of the area and another who are you know assisting or giving the best yields in uh, uh, one of the crop in one of the area then the whole team will go there and they will interview them they will make some short videos taking uh, and then will upload them and at the same time it was again a challenge how we make a, uh, we make a, them uh, available that content so one uh, whatsapp interface was created and that was given to them so in today's uh, this uh, one of my scholar is also working in the same field as wireless and some networks in greenhouses. So let me begin with the presentation outline. So that is the digital Kisan. After see this presentation, I will I will share you a few of the videos and then we can discuss that how we can make the uh, content and we connect with the farmers because whatever technology we create, if the users and users is not aware, uh, aware of and not well versed with how to connect with uh, that technology, how to use. So it is of uh, no use, I will say. And uh, then the next uh, part is uh, the, what is the greenhouse? So that is, uh, I have taken it from the Fresh, uh, if Fresh uh, Private Limited, who are uh, you know uh, providing services to the farmers in India, so how to construct a greenhouse and how can they increase the, uh, the yield. Then the brief of what is wireless sensing networks, and then what is the process of monitoring and control, what are the various aspects like layouts, and then sensors, taking the data, then sampling, then we are using the routing protocol, then we are taking some decisions, and then we are uh, going to take the, the action to actuators. So the same layouts and sampling, and then what are the communication technologies which are being used in the in the you can say the greenhouses that we'll discuss on and then a few of the prediction models and then finally the summary so let me it's not uh, giving uh, stop okay i need to put into five there is a five So this is uh, the brief uh, of uh, the, what is the wireless sensor network that uh, is already familiar with. Uh, this wireless sensor network is consisting of uh, specially distributed autonomous devices that are uh, using sensors to monitor physical or environmental conditions. So these are the sensors which are shown here. And uh, the sensors are giving this data to the sync node. And then through internet or some uh, medium, they are going to the base station and user applications. So this is the basic overview. I think all the uh, you know uh, persons familiar with the electronics and the computer science background are familiar already familiar with this. Then what is the importance? What is the need of our lessons and network um, in agriculture? All right. So over the years, as you say, the population has increased. According to UN's uh, World Population Prospects 2017, the report that uh, uh, population will be around uh, 9.8 billion by 2050. And along with the uh, population, demand for food is also going to be multiplied. 
and uh, according to the food and agriculture organization of united nations although there are 30000 types of edible plants available for uh, human cultivation only 4% of it are being uh, you can say used the agricultural land has considerably reduced due to various factors like uh, urbanization and industrialization and to cope up with these situations modern day technological solutions are required and that is the one which is uh, we can use this wireless sensor networks for the agriculture and along with this there is another problem of the water scarcity and that uh, because of the water scarcity or increase in fertilization and dynamic climate changes that have also strained to integrate uh, technology to achieve required production in agriculture and that's true with the minimum wastage of resources so whatever is available or whatever land is available to us whatever water uh, resources are available to us that we are going to take best uh, use of them with the help of our technology and this uh, wireless sensor network is one of the prominent technology that has developed over the past few years and has found its path in many applications earlier also that is application military defense healthcare and now it is uh, giving more applications in the agriculture more researchers have focused their attention on the agriculture and now wireless uh, sensor network is particularly used to achieve a, a stage called the precision agriculture so that is uh, the to topic that we are uh, you know on which uh, this faculty developed program is that more of uh, precision agriculture we must have gone through and this precision agriculture is a management strategy that employs information technology to improve quality and the production and it also works on the phenomena of observing sensors responding and that responding is through you can say the actuators and tries to achieve uh, parametric values and conditions required for optimum health and yield of the crop and the precision agriculture also focuses on optimizing resources used for production and uh, we can also see one of the you can see yeah so that was uh, we were talking about the annotate that there are uh, 30000 that that is that diagram is shown the world economic forum has published that article that there are 30000 plants that can be used as food and out of these uh, 7000 plants uh, were uh, cultivated for food all over the world traditionally now 170 crops grown on a commercial scale now this includes species and beverages like tea and coffee so we are focused on 170 such crops and 30 crops are that provide most of the world's calories and nutrients now we don't know how many crops we are going to you know uh, cultivate in india but there are the three crops which are major uh, which are used across the world uh, that is rice wheat and maize which provides 40 percent of our daily calories and most of the you know farmers are focused on these three but there are so many other advantages as we discussed that uh, the farmers should go through all these 30 and our botanicalist or you can say the agriculturalist should also find out certain ways that how we can find out that all the 30 you know plants 30000 plants that can be used as food can be you know given the space to the farmers that they can cultivate it although maybe in the lab first and then to the actual life actual farm slide So this is the complete process of monitoring and control and this is the sensor deployment first on the layout then the sensing with the sampling technologies techniques that how frequently we should transmit our sense data 
then uh, transmitting information uh, through the communication technologies, then analysis and design, management, predictive modeling, fuzzy logical fusion. But before we go into the details of this, we'd like to go through the brief of the greenhouse. Uh, what is the greenhouse? And uh, let me let me share with you. Yes. Okay, that is the, the brief of this greenhouse. Then we'll go back to our uh, presentation. So, as you see, this is the one of the view of the greenhouse. The, let me say the heights and this, the trading part on the board. And this is the protected agriculture for high value crops. And that is the main focus here is uh, what is the greenhouse? Uh, so the greenhouse is a structure covered with a transparent material that is on this side um, in which various crops are grown under a system of farming known as protected cultivation. So this is the one point that uh, it, 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 it is used to provide the protected cultivation. The structure is also referred as the glass house or the poly house depending upon the cladding material that we are going to use. So there are many materials uh, according to the crop we are going to use. Uh, these uh, gliding materials are being used, and according to the time duration, whether we want it five, five, five years, ten years, fifteen years, or more, these gliding materials are being used. So once farmer must be sure enough that uh, what he wa wants to cultivate and how long that he will continue to cultivate in the same, uh, these poly houses are being selected. So under greenhouse technology, favorable uh, microclimatic conditions. So uh, there may be uh, many zones within one. Uh, um, we can say the greenhouse and we, with the help of uh, WSN, we can try to control these microclimatic conditions uh, which are created to uh, suiting to these uh, crops which we are going to raise over there. So greenhouse uh, protects plants from adverse climatic conditions such as wind, low temperature, uh, rainfall, excessive radiation, extreme temperature and pests. So that is true. So greenhouse technology facilitates off-season uh, off production of crops to realize high returns so that the uh, farmer has to choose which uh, crop is to be cultivated in one of the season and which is to be uh, more beneficial to them. So what are the advantages? Advantages are that it ensures a multifold increase in crop output compared to the open cultivation. So once you go for open cultivation, and the kind of uh, yield we get, and if it is a you know controlled uh, microclimatic environment, then obviously the, uh, the um, conditions will suit to the crop, and uh, the more yield will be there. So the output uh, of the crop will be more; uh, it will be manifold increase. It uh, facilitates year-round production of the selected crops. So it is not like in the season, particular season only you can grow the crop; it can be around the year. Then it mitigates impact of adverse climatic conditions in respect of certain types of greenhouse that is uh, well known and facilitates substantial control of pests and disease that is also because in uh, inside environment uh, the, the sensors we can use and we, and we can mon monitor that environment and if any pest is required or if a pest is excessive then all those uh, actions can be taken up if disease is uh, taking place then that control of the disease can also be done in that situation. And it facilitates optimum utilization of all inputs, uh, facilitates the raising of off-season production of the crops, aids in nursery propagation, hardening of plants. It facilitates high-tech cultivation practices like hydroponic, aeroponic, and nutrient film technology. So, uh, hydroponic and aeroponic, you know, uh, these are the two areas where farmers have not taken up uh, this challenge openly because nowadays researchers are using the you know cultivation using hydroponic or the aeroponic and that is acting as a lab itself and they are making the prototype or covering a small area but they are not able to convince till now that uh, farmer are taking up this excessively that they are using hydroponic or the aeroponic uh, for the cultivation of their crops so when uh, 
the technology reaches to the farmers and they openly uh, you know accepts that that uh, we can uh, even choose uh, the hydroponic and aeroponic uh, forms of uh, farming as well so then i think uh, the change in the conditions of the farmers will also take place then what are the greenhouse types and shapes so that is uh, just to have an idea that uh, and there is not only a specific shape uh, that the greenhouse is having, that is the rigid frame shape, onset, the, the triangular shape, um, and you know, polygon type shape like this. And uh, there can be a different types of greenhouses that allow multiple straight uh, live-in to greenhouse can fit under the roof of a single story house. And this is an example of the carved leaves that can fit into a single story house, and this is even span attached to a uh, garage, uh, which allows a larger greenhouse in a limited space that is also uh, possible. So, there are lean type of greenhouses, even span type greenhouses, uneven span type greenhouses, region photo types uh, greenhouses, uh, sarto type greenhouses, conosect like this uh, greenhouses, interlock ridges and phototype uh, conosite greenhouses and ground to ground greenhouses so there are uh, uh, depending upon the requirement depending upon the availability of space bean greenhouses can be built up now uh, greenhouses based on the utility that greenhouses for the active heating that can also be uh, used and the greenhouse for the active cooling and that can also be uh, built up and another type is uh, on the basis of its construction that wooden frame uh, greenhouses or the pipe frame greenhouses and the truss frame uh, structure. Then we have greenhouse types uh, based on the covering material. So this covering material uh, is generally known as the cladding. So if we, if we have on the top as the glass glazing, and that is uh, something like this, and the fiberglass uh, reinforced plastic FRP glazing, or the plain seat, or the corrugated seat, or the para, uh, plastic film, or UV stabilized LDP film, spellen uh, type tree. So these all these types are uh, you know chosen uh, as per the availability or the cultivation of the crop, which crop one is going to grow. And then there is the low cost or low tech greenhouses. And these are the low cost greenhouses, which is a, a simple structure like this is on a very simple structure and constructed with locally available materials such as a bamboo, timber, etc. So in this case, most of the, you know, uh, these uh, are made using bamboos. And on the top is the ultraviolet film that is used uh, as cladding to cover the roof and the sides, increasing or decreasing the temperature and humidity. And that is achieved mostly by opening the side walls. If you open the side wall, then obviously the temperature will increase or decrease depending upon the situation. And it is suitable for cold climatic zones as well, and suitable for high value vegetable crops during off season. <clears throat> so one farmer, if one is hesitant, then one can begin with such type of low cost, low tech uh, greenhouses and further if uh, it sees the benefits are there, then then can go for the um, another that is the tomato cultivation is low tech greenhouse that is inside view uh, in that case and outside view of the low tech greenhouse. So there will be many such greenhouses and uh, this cultivation can take place. So once begin with the low tech and then can go to similarly with the semi automated and the fully automated depending upon the crop and the investment when a farmer is ready to um, invest for the greenhouses. So and this is the medium tech greenhouses, which is semi-automatic. So it is less expensive compared to high tech greenhouse and uh, it's a control possible manually uh, or semi-automated. So in this semi-automated, our sensors and actuators uh, will come and uh, actuators will not be automatic or rather uh, actuators will be manually controlled. So one can sense the data and accordingly uh, the actuators will be switched on and the switch off. And uh, GI material can be used for uh, framework, exhaust fans, thermostat to control this temperature, they can be used. And the cooling pads, mist uh, system to control humidity, sunlight control by regulating uh, straight nets, and it, it needs more attention in operations. That is true because 
uh, actuators are being controlled manually, but the sense data is being observed by the farmer itself, and then the action is taken with the help of actuators. And because of that action, it is uh, known as the semi automated. And then the suitable for dry and composite climate zones. Then this is the example of the high tech. So this is a high tech greenhouse, which is fully automatic, as you can see. So this is the fully automatic controls will be there. The temperature or humidity sensors will be there and they will be connected with the processor. And uh, as per the decision uh, inbuilt to them, the actuators will be switched on and uh, switched off. So it requires less uh, attention in the operations. Uh, it uses computer software for the controls and its initial cost will be very high. And it is more suitable to the high end applications like floriculture, hydroponic and aeroponics. So once uh, the yield and the cost is uh, high of the crop that uh, is being cultivated there, and so then that can be decided uh, and uh, that which crop or uh, which type of uh, whether the floriculture will be uh, cultivated or you can say they will be using hydroponics or the aeroponics. So uh, its uh, yield or its output will be dependent on that and it requires availability of power. That is the one aspect because uh, your uh, climate control uh, it cannot be done without the power. So some may require some additional source of the power there maybe the solar cell can be used or maybe some gen, gen set is required for these high tech or the fully automated greenhouses so that's why the initial cost will be high in these cases and there's a very simple one which is the shed net greenhouses which are used by most of the nurseries that is very uh, easy to construct and it is being provided only the shed on the outer uh, or as a cladding like there it's suitable for commercial nurseries. You can say vegetable crops during hot weather. It provides protection from the excessive sunlight, heat, cold, wind, frost, and the hailstorm. It also offers protection from uh, insects, birds, etc. It is a low cost construction, and because of this low cost construction, many of the farmers or the nurseries are using it. And these are the typical components of the greenhouses that. Uh, uh, what is more important is that there is a fridge, which is a ventilator over here. So one actuator can be uh, installed here, and this is the lateral ventilation next. So one can be installed here, and rest of these can be used for installation of the sensors or communicating from your data from one uh, node to the another node. So your power supply lines can be provided across these solid frames. There are the other different shapes of the greenhouses. So you can have dome types in this con site, A frame, and Gothic, ridge frame, like that. So um, there is no fixed shape of, and this is another semi automated medium uh, cost greenhouse example. In this case, it is shown that there is a water pump is there. And in order to control this water pump, that has a pipe uh, going to different, different parts, and there is a exhaust fan so according to a microclimatic condition required for the crop to achieve that these uh, are switched on and switched off accordingly so these are not um, these are only two uh, you can say the <coughs> actuators connected to them motor and all and this is the uh, coverage of different kinds of covering material that the cladding material, their durability, their transmission of the heat or the percentage of heat and the maintenance. So there's the one comparison. If you have polyethylene, then its durability is one year and transmission of like 90 or 70% of the heat and maintenance is very low. If you have PE that is UV resistant, then its durability is two years and transmission uh, of the light or heat is 90 or 70%, its maintenance is high. Then the fiberglass is there, which can be uh, used for the five years and the transmission of light is 90 or the heat percentage is five and the maintenance is low. Then tedler coated uh, fiberglass is used, which has uh, the duration uh, durability of the 15 years. So, and this maintenance is also low. And the double strength glass that is uh, having the highest durability, that is the 50 years. And it has uh, a dissipation of 5% of heat and the transmission of light can be 90%. Uh, and the maintenance is low and the polycarbonate that is 10 to 15 years and the heat dissipation 5% and maintenance cost is very low. So one can think of 
uh, the maintenance point of view, which is very low, like the polycarbonate as well, which are having a high durability of 10 to 15 years. Um, but depending upon the crop to be cultivated and the initial course when farmer is willing to, that can be, uh, you know, a stall. And uh, along with this, there are many government schemes also which provide uh, you know, the subsidy on this construction of the polling houses that can also be availed of. Then there's the crop suitability. Then the low cost greenhouse are next, nurseries of high value vegetables like tomato, chilies, etc. The nurseries of high value fruits like papaya, strawberries, etc. Then the ornamental nurseries, vermiculture. So these these are the low cost greenhouse set next. And this is the example which is shown over here. So this is the one. Then another is uh, the medium cost. Then for the medium cost, um, one can cultivate uh, the seed seed purification for screening tests uh, for the seed industry. The vegetable can, uh, cultivation can be. Uh, value crops like melons, capsicum, beans, cucumbers, tomato, and uh, export of floriculture like rose, carnations, radius, and the tissue culture like hardening of banana, strawberry, all these can be uh, used uh, within the medium cost uh, greenhouse. Then uh, there is another crop stability, which is a high cost greenhouse. And this high cost greenhouse uh, is a Hydroponic or the aeroponic cultivation, which is the soilless cultivation that can be used. And in this case of uh, soilless, uh, there are many disadvantages for uh, hydroponic or aeroponic cultivation. And uh, one can uh, use the new plant growing technique in the agriculture. And uh, Mostly nowadays, it is practiced by the researchers for performing the experimental studies, and their study reports uh, concludes that it can be accepted for agriculture as a modern-day plant uh, technology cultivation activity. But the modern farmer does not need soil to grow the plant. That uh, needs to be convinced to the farmer. Uh, the aeroponic system has some substantial vulnerability, like a failure of water supply. Uh, what supply pumps, nutrient distribution line, and preparation and optimization nozzle clogging, which requires special knowledge and attention to avoid damage, uh, the rapid plant length and the failure of the system. So there are multiple things which will be required if the farmer is convinced. Then one uh, can say that WSN is more suitable in this area, and uh, the sensors of the high quality, the processing, data processing and that needs technical expertise and uh, technical expertise from the botanical side also that what action is to be taken in case of the less uh, i can say one of the parameter or, or in case of any disease so because of that uh, this has been limited to uh, the case studies or you can say the research work itself but i think the time will come then uh, the farmers will go for the hydroponic and aerophonic cultivation as well and uh, they will perform or trade tissue culture, mushroom culture, highly vegetables, tomato and peas uh, using uh, or many other crops using uh, hydroponic. And this, the, finally, what are the benefits and risks? The benefits of using uh, greenhouse basically. So the benefits are uh, off season cultivation is possible using the greenhouses and it can enhance the yield and the productivity and the quality of the crop. Uh, and the, it can use efficient use of the inputs and effective control of the pests and disease. That is the, one of the important aspects that uh, uh, excessive pest is not required. And if some disease is there, that can be controlled. And um, the implementation of this tissue culture uh, techniques that can also be utilized. The commercial nurseries of high value crops. It is also hydroponic and aeroponic cultivation of crops that is possible. But there are the risks involved. And because of these risks, the farmers are hesitant in adopting this technology. Let's have a look into the risks. Uh, this is not a high uh, initial investment. If the initial investment is low and it increases gradually, then the farmers can be motivated. So the government needs to uh, come forward over here that in the initial year, they will not charge anything or very small value. Then the farmers can be motivated. There's a more need uh, for the skilled manpower and then suitable for the limited crops 
and all crops doesn't require this uh, greenhouse kind of environment the high maintenance cost that is true difficult to maintain optimum growing conditions sometimes uh, uh, it's really difficult to uh, you can say the maintain the microclimatic condition inside the greenhouse and it requires uh, expertise and the fertilizer deficiencies are also there or sometimes it can be excess but that can be controlled and it can use the release of the toxic gases that has to be careful about and the power failure will disturb the climatic conditions and can go into a different way and susceptibility to the certain pests mites and the fungal disease that need the special attention but that is risk is there the tall growing tendency of the plants the tall growing plants cannot be cultivated inside the greenhouse and the difficulty in inner cultivation in the land cultivation that is also because uh, the, the normal tractors that are being used for the cultivation in the open form those cannot be taken inside so there are some other arrangement can be made so there is uh, to do high wind or the fire or the calamities that is true so those are the risks and uh, those are the benefits if one can weigh that uh, the benefits are more and one can overcome more this risk then the farmers can be motivated to go for the greenhouses but that was the introduction of this uh, we can say the greenhouses and uh, and let we can come back to our slides to this point yes yeah. so that is the this one the complete uh, monitoring control and there was the sensor deployment so first we'll discuss the sensor deployment then the sensing there's the sampling techniques and then the transmitting trans this information with the help of, uh, say, the communication technologies, whether we are going to use a GPRS, Digby, Wi-Fi, low range, uh, or some another technology. Then the analysis and the decision making, the decision management, where uh, predictive modeling can also be used, fuzzy logics can be implemented, and some kind of diffusion rules can also be made over there. So the first is the layouts. So what are the layouts? So layout uh, means the way in which something is arranged. So layout should not be confused with the topology. And topology refers to uh, placement of nodes to represent direction of flow of information. While layout is a physical placement of node, layout is also uh, referred. So this is the layout. And layout is also uh, referred to as physical uh, topology sometimes. And the sensor layout is an important fact which must be paid appropriate attention. Greenhouse is a very dynamic environment where parameters change specially as well as uh, temporarily. Crops will grow over time and will eventually affect uh, performance of the sensors because once the size of the uh, crop is increasing, it uh, will you know, not allow the sensors to cover the larger area. So a larger greenhouse will have particularly many microclimatic zones within itself. Uh, homogeneity may not be maintained over there. It may uh, also have heterogeneous zones where parameters and overall environment different from the surrounding zones within the single greenhouse that is possible. These uh, microclimates exist both horizontally as well as vertically in a greenhouse. So we need to you know use sensors in, in case of the horizontal um, and in vertical as well. So we have uh, certain you know found certain experiments where researchers have deployed uh, horizontal nodes and they have deployed uh, vertical node cells and some of them are hybrid also so and from there the monitoring of these parameters requires non-uniform deployment of the sensors irrigation and fertilization uh, you can see the patterns will, that also decide in location of these sensors where we'll be using the irrigation points or the fertilization so the layout of the sensors in the greenhouse uh, that has been categorized broadly as uh, horizontal, vertical, let me see, next slide. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the, one type where yeah. 
so where uh, we have categorization as horizontal, vertical, and other. So horizontal, we have grid type. We have grid type. We have tessellations. Uh, tessellations is some, similar to that of our, uh, what do you call that as a mobile range, mobile cells. And RNDA, then row only, the separate uh, topology for sensors and routers, divided in regions. And in vertical, we have sensors at separate heights. Sensors at uh, one height level, sensors and uh, coordinator at the separate levels. We have others at the hybrid, in which we have horizontal sensors placed and as well as vertical sensors placed. Then we have 3D row column, we have model uh, greenhouse, we have tire based uh, layouts that is also possible. So, in case of horizontal layouts, the conventional systems have either been a random or a grid. Uh, Horizontal layout of the sensors. Let me see in the next slide. So the conventional systems have either random or the grid layout of the sensors in the greenhouse. And some have proposed to place the six nodes in a row and columns crossing each other to form a grid. The grid covers the area of, you can say, 20 by uh, 50 meter of the tomato greenhouse. And the bridge node was placed in between the longer edge of the greenhouse in the middle. So the similar setup uh, can be cited to power a larger greenhouse, uh, like 30 by 30 length of units. And we'll see that uh, uh, another example of that. And there are uh, um, many other uh, grid layouts to increase the network lifetime within the grid. The RT cluster topology was presented, and the present nodes are proposed to have redundant nodes to improve the network lifetime. And uh, what we have here is the tessellation. Although greenhouse is a closed loop, uh, closed control loop in itself, it cannot be assumed to be completely independent of outside climatic conditions. Sometimes there is a requirement of monitoring outside environment of greenhouse along with the inside environment. So we can place some of the sensors outside the greenhouse and some of the sensors inside the greenhouse. So during uh, this layout stage, we uh, place uh, these sensors appropriately to ensure uh, the monitoring of the parameters like temperature, humidity, rain, etc. And these outside sensors can form their own topology isolated from in, in, inside sensor nodes. And uh, we can have another nodes to transmit that for the outside and one for the inside one. Similarly, we have uh, these uh, tessellations, which you can show here, here. And these tessellations are similar to that of our uh, uh, polygons. And this um, of the area like uh, of the hexagonal a poly polygon, this is a square, it may be triangular. So these uh, tessellations are used used to cover the entire area. So once we have a large greenhouse and we want to cover the entire greenhouse area, there we can utilize these, uh, you can say the tessellations. Otherwise we can uh, make it uh, uh, with the help of the horizontal or the vertical grids. And there are the another topologies that we have. Let us see, this is one where we have Um, innermost layer node, we have these middle layer nodes, and we have uh, the outermost layer nodes. So we can provide different, different energies, different, different, uh, uh, you can say the conditions to these nodes, and that can be uh, provided. So uh, that can be implemented. Then we have another. Uh, that is the redundant node uh, deployment algorithm. And in uh, redundant node uh, deployment algorithm that utilizes the concept of load balancing to increase network lifetime. So sometimes whatever node we use that uh, uh, to increase uh, its lifetime, we have to place them as randomly. So very few numbers of the redundant nodes network uh, lifetime can be prolonged for thousands of rounds. Uh, other than grid, random layout is also simple. While grid is the most commonly used layout, 
uh, but uh, this random node uh, algorithm is also a popular uh, layout uh, technology. And for deployment of the sensor layout in this case, along with the number of sensors, props, the measured parameter is an important factor. So the grid technology seems to be simple to be deployed. It may be over the edge deployment and the wastage of the node sometimes in the greenhouse environment. Overlap is a serious issue in the square grid lay, uh, layout. Secondly, few environmental parameters do not change within few meters in a greenhouse. So that is true. So for the measurement of the parameters like temperature, humidity and illumination, grid layout does not work optimally. So for parameters where range of variability of the uh, parameter is within few meters like soil temperature and soil moisture and soil pH uh, grid layout is suitable but requires more number of sensors and has cost more. So, so for example, if in a certain field, a range of variability of soil uh, moisture is 15 meter and distance among uh, nodes and then it should be less than 15 meters because up to 15 meters that uh, the pH range will remain the same and the sensor will be able to sense that data. But uh, beyond that it will not be so we need to have another uh, sensor node uh, around that 15 meter for the efficient monitoring. And the tessellations which we discussed uh, are still unexplored area uh, like this one. This uh, These tessellations uh, which is still uh, uh, more attention is required in this case by optimizing the number of layers node density can be optimized including the idea of outside sensors that can also help in considering the ignored factors of outside environment also analysis of outside in parameters like illumination and the wind speed can add an additional perspective to the monitoring greenhouses for crops grown inside greenhouse uh, vapor pressure deficit is more enlightening parameter than relative humidity so the vapor pressure deficit represents the difference between actual moisture level in the air and moisture level at the full saturation. So we need to see this link also. And as the difference between these two increases, so vapor uh, pressure deficit increases. So crops try to draw more water from the roots and the rate of uh, transpiration that increases. So if uh, vapor pressure deficit is less then water condenses out of the air on the crop leaves and thus uh, this vapor pressure deficit provides assistance for disease uh, forecast. So for analysis purpose like in an application where a control group needs to be compared with the experimental group field divided in uh, regions fit best and in these tessellations and the concept of moving nodes seems very attractive but it comes with the constraints of moving path without hindrance of crop environment, greenhouses, a spread over hectares, moving nodes can provide an additional aid in monitoring. So we can uh, have some nodes as fixed and we can have some nodes as the moving. So for the parameters having short range of variability, moving node can, moving node can put uh, uh, what you call that as uh, um, uh, with the help of a robotic uh, assistance and that can ease the monitoring process. So the isolation of topology of sensors and routers prolongs the network lifetime and manages the risk. And the triangular lattice topology used for the routing nodes help in reducing overlapping. Isolation of networks for sensitive uh, sensors like carbon dioxide, concentration sensors with compatibility issues that can also help in prolonging the lifetime. In case of supplemental uh, light sources, sensors should be rightly positioned to capture the true value of the illumination and irradiation reaching to the crop. So for that purpose, we can uh, use different different layers and we can uh, provide access uh, to that. And there is uh, another one, which is the mode kind of like uh, 3D kind of mode. So what you can say that uh, other than the horizontal and vertical layout of the sensors in this uh, greenhouse, few other layouts are uh, proposed and the hybrid of both layouts can prove to be quite uh, promising in monitoring of the greenhouse. Like this one is uh, deployment at the horizontal level is possible and deployment at the vertical level is also possible. And uh, <clears throat> some of the researchers like Elio 
that proposed to have a 20 sensor nodes at five different points and four at different heights, say uh, at uh, about uh, few, uh, one meter to three to four meters. And this hybrid layout was deployed for disease uh, forecasting. In another work, uh, lettuce was grown in a greenhouse on cells with nine sensor nodes on each cell to check the com and compare the reliability of the proposed system few cells were deployed over and above. So we have uh, one uh, uh, layer and then as the crop grows, another layer of the census was deployed and another layer of the census was deployed. So as the crop grow, we need to get uh, the complete information about uh, the uh, climatic conditions inside the greenhouse. So once we increase the number of cells uh, in the various experiments, then the nodes can be placed in the 3D row column grid that is known as the grid structure. So this uh, node, this is uh, similar to that of the grid structure, which is being implemented. And this model greenhouse is of the common layouts used for the uh, verification and the testing part. And uh, that uh, uh, is smaller and the normal greenhouse and replicates the interior environment of the actual greenhouse. So home greenhouse are an, also an example of the model greenhouses. So only single sensor node or is sufficient to monitor it and the information is directly communicated to server without uh, any bridge or the gateway. So that is a model greenhouse. Um, if you are uh, implementing it at our home, then that can be uh, more suited. Uh, you can say the sensor deployment technique. And if there is a change in any of the parameter there, then may affect the another parameter like illumination or radiation intensity can affect the measurement of the temperature and humidity. And so accordingly, these nodes are proposed. So in some of the experiments, as you can see, some of the sensor nodes which are being deployed in different different uh, locations and uh, for performing different different, uh, you can say, the activities. Then this is the example for the horizontal uh, layout by Mancuso and Professor 2006. Now this is the one example for the cultivation of the tomato. Now this is very interesting point that you can also notice and that is true for di uh, different different crops and but the temperature and these values will vary depending upon the crop which is being cultivated. Like in this case, this is the first phase of the deployment, like the deployment before flowering. So the low intensity of the light, or you can see the temperature to the range of 13 to 14 degrees centigrade is required. This is the optimal soil temperature. If the strong intensity of light is there, then it can be from 70 to 20 degree. Now, when the flowering starts, then uh, this temperature requirement is still in, uh, slightly increases, that is 15 to 16 degree. And uh, when the strong intensity of light is there, then it is uh, around 19 to 22. And for the harvesting, uh, the temperature requirement is different. That is 20 to 22 and uh, for the low intensity and uh, for the strong intensity it is 23 to 25. So likewise, uh, we cannot say that uh, while we are, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> germinating any any of the seed and at the same time whatever conditions are required that will be same throughout the you know crop uh, you know grows so at the different uh, phases of that crop uh, different different requirements will be there and for different different requirements will need to have different different conditions so whatever uh, sensor network deployment will do so will have to be that has to be you can say the flexible or the dynamic in nature so that at different different timings as per the requirement of the crop we can adjust our values so say earlier if we are you know at the development before flowering at that stage and we have fit in our value as threshold as the 14 degrees say centigrade for low intensity of light and thereafter we'll have to slightly increase it as the crop grows so uh, for different different crops that has to be taken up and this is the one area where you know the technologist and the agriculturist that both can come together and can find out this uh, kind of ranges and can provide uh, at least for one crop one of the system then for another crop another type of the requirement so that um, that uh, you can say easy plug and play kind of uh, 
uh, WSN SNS nodes deployment can be uh, carried out successfully. So in this case of this experimentation by uh, these researchers, that node, uh, that type of, uh, you can say the deployment, that is the horizontal deployment was done. And you can say this, uh, these are the nodes which were deployed. These are the sensor nodes. And this is the mesh node, which is the repeater. This is the 20 meter area. And this is the 50 meter area on which uh, the deployment was done. And this is the base station. So the sensor nodes are uh, giving this data to the radio waves to the bridge node over there. And this is connected with the ethernet or to the LAN and then given to the base station. And from base station, you know, whatever is the requirement from where you want to deploy the control station or want to transmit that information that is possible. So the, uh, the main thing inside the greenhouse is, uh, you know, capturing these uh, sensed uh, values and how do we capture what is the frequency of cap uh, you know sampling that uh, we'll discuss in the next slides but there is uh, one more example we'll take up for the uh, vertical node layout so this is the vertical layout by ahonen et al in 2008 and this is the sensor board Equipped with the luminosity and temperature humidity sensor and carbon dioxide sensor on this board. And uh, this is the kind of uh, greenhouse that, that has one sensor node, one or two are here, and on this four and three. So these sensor nodes are at different, different heights. You can see one level is there, one level is there. So these uh, sensor nodes at different heights, that means they are being using as the vertical layouts. So vertical layout of sensors, how they have actually placed that sensor node that can be seen from there. That one sensor node is placed here, another sensor node sometimes uh, somewhere uh, placed here. So node two and node three inside the red squares in a greenhouse test setup. So this is uh, done by, and this is uh, the example of for your vertical layout. Then we have another mixed, one more example. This is the hybrid layout. So there, Elo at all in 2018, they deployed this Arduino GPB knot. So this is the one example. This is the semantic of the greenhouse. So these are the shown as one, two, three, four at different different heights. And these uh, heights are labeled as this 7,000, 1,500, 2, 2.2 and then 3.8 like that. And uh, this deployment was uh, horizontal as well as vertical. Both type of deployments were done by Halo. Then we had uh, another, uh, we can say, <clears throat> captured this information similar type, which are using the horizontal kind of layout. So we made uh, one table uh, where the kind of layout which has been there, or kind of crop which has been cultivated, the number of nodes that were used, and the area in which that greenhouse was there, and what was their focus. Uh, whether it was uh, predictive modeling, whether it was some uh, microclimatic modeling, that was being done. So, let us see, this we have already done. This is uh, the random node deployment algorithm. That is, uh, once we place the, uh, nodes that's two in the horizontal itself but randomly there's no grid or some particular um, layout that was being done by strong at all and the number of nodes that were used was 25 and the area covered was 125 centimeter so this is one uh, prototype, prototype that was made by uh, song at all and that uh, deployment and the load balancing was shown and that was a focus area. Then the tessellations, the tessellations which will show the polygon types that uh, are uh, cellular cells are also being using uh, the similar kind of tessellations. And that uh, the Sava was the crop and depending on the number of layers, uh, the nodes were deployed, but this area was very large and it was done for the deployment and the routing strategy. And another layout that was divided in regions, one region uh, of so the two region, three region. So depending upon this uh, um, the greenhouse that was divided into multiple regions for the orchard. 
and there were 24 nodes and the two gateways one gateway for one one of the region and the gateway for the another of the region and deployment was uh, area code was 130 centimeter by 140 by 150 and it was done for the predictive modeling then for rows only it was done for the mango trees and it was uh, 273 seven on each tree three lanes of the 13 trees in each and this is the area and it was done for the path loss modeling then the separate topology for sensors and routers for the tomato that was 30 sensors uh, out of those 30 20 sensors nine routers and one gateway those were the 30 number of nodes and area covered was 50 meter by 50 meter and the purpose was to study the effect of crop uh, growth on the connectivity so these were and still we have uh, not come up with the standard uh, horizontal layout pattern so I think that can be the one of the research open research area that we started in 2006, 11, uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18, and different different uh, horizontal layouts are there. So that can be one focused area where one can work that uh, this type of horizontal layout will suit better and can propose a new kind of horizontal layout. And similarly, we have vertical layouts uh, and. These kind of layouts are again send the sensor in the separate heights, uh, and then we have sensors at the same height level and sensor at the coordinator at the separate level. So this is another open area where uh, the vertical uh, layout of the sensors is not uh, you can say the standardized. So for the standardization, one can work on uh, in this case, and uh, there are a few references. <clears throat> that uh, the crop uh, that was focused in this case was tomato. The number of Heights and zones were four, and the height levels were one was at 120 centimeter, another was 176, 275, like that. So it was vertical, and the focus area was the microclimatic monitoring. Then we use it for Rahima at all at Mango. The number of height zones were seven at 0.5 meter, one meter, 1.5 meter, two meter at different different uh, height levels, and the number of nodes seven on each tree. That was uh, Estimating the path loss model. Then for Chile, also it was done, which was above the canopy of 1.5 meter for my microclimatic monitoring. Then we have the, the kind of probe was not mentioned there, but the number of height zones were seven and two sets of sensors. So total 14 sensors were used, and that was used for the calibration of the sensors. Then for the tomato, again, uh, number of uh, height zones were two, so at 0.5 meter and 3 meter. So number of nodes is two. So this was the predictive modeling and the parameter. That is also one of the important uh, aspect in this case of uh, greenhouse, uh, WSM in greenhouse. In the pepper vegetable, that height was changed according to the growth of the plant. That was the unique one that as the uh, you know uh, crop grows, uh, depending upon the growth, uh, that height, the placement of sensors was changed, made variable. And there will be no fix. For example, uh, if we install at the ground level uh, at the time of germination, then after a few weeks it grows up. Then we change that height, and then the sensor uh, set will remain the same, but it will keep on changing its height. And uh, that was done for the final height was 2.5 meter. The three nodes and the five nodes in the two different scenarios that were tested. It was used only for the monitoring purpose. Then. Sensor at uh, one height level that was used for the strawberry at one meter, and there were three number of nodes that was the production crop. So we have considered that to be at one level, but not at the ground level, so that we have considered as the vertical layout. Then the sensor and the coordinator at the separate levels for the tomato, then the coordinator at the height of 65 meter that was used for the monitoring purpose, and this coordinator at the height of 3.5 meter in the middle. So that was done for the fuzzy inference system. So similarly, uh, there were a few more examples that were taken up for the hybrid layouts. <clears throat> so that uh, we already discussed the silo at all horizontal. It has 100 um, modes, 20 modes at five points and at different different height levels. And the area code was 24. Uh, this is forecasting. Then we had lectures, 37, nine on each of the four cells, one gateway, then between the ground to 200 centimeter, then monitoring and disease forecasting. 
and we have another for the tomato and that is for the number of nodes as 38 that's it then yeah that that uh, will also suit this. A sensor at three heights and uh, one gateway one outdoor weather station and these are the monitoring so let let me go to the next point which is the sampling technique and its importance so we'll take up that uh, one of the question in the chat box after the presentation the analysis part <clears throat> although number of uh, the samples which are to be transmitted sensed by these nodes are very less but but uh, the continuous uh, transmission of the sample data that uh, you know uses lots of the energy and uh, that is <coughs> sampling in the, in the terms of statistical analysis that means taking few samples from a larger population so instead of transmitting all the values for example if we are monitoring temperature and if we keep on transmitting the same information then uh, there is uh, <coughs> hardly any change uh, which is uh, you know abrupt change in the temperature uh, that is not going to take any you know advantage so uh, what we can do is we can uh, you know sample uh, we can take certain points at some instances and then we can transmit after some time interval we can transmit after taking some you can say the threshold boundary plus and minus and if the value falls within that then can be transmitted or we can take an average of the last uh, few samples and then we can tra transmit so there are accordingly uh, like in corona also we had uh, um, earlier as a number of uh, you know positives that were of more importance today tomorrow like that but nowadays when it raised to the lakhs then it was uh, you know seven days average so sometimes the number of tests are less sometimes the number of tests are more so that was taken as uh, the significant value as the uh, average uh, for the seven days you can say so similarly from this uh, <clears throat> samples the average can also be taken up so accordingly there have been uh, multiple we, we can say the multiple uh, uh, sampling techniques uh, that are being used though so the sampling uh, you can say is the process of uh, sending uh, data samples through a trans receiver to a next sensor node gateway or directly to the central server Sampling has a deep impact on the network lifetime. Most of the energy consumption in the setup of wireless sensor network is consumed by uh, transceiver or the radio. If you see if it is there like this. So if we take up uh, the consumption, so you will find most of this is uh, from this radio part, and uh, very less is taken by the microprocessor unit and uh, the sensor unit. So if we can uh, avoid transmitting all the sense uh, points so data or the packets throughout then that can be energy saving so this sampling uh, sampling techniques decides how much uh, out of the measured data is transmitted via transmitter and at what frequency since in a typical greenhouse environment uh, the value of parameters may not change for even hours so it is not required to transmit data frequently and uh, the greenhouse monitoring requires application specific sampling techniques so this uh, we can uh, you know use depending upon the crop the simplest of this is the periodic sampling we are sending some data at the periodic intervals and this periodic sampling is the most commonly used sampling uh, technique although these sampling intervals may have different ranging from the few seconds to few hours so we can uh, sample the uh, data and transmit say after the every half an hour after every two hours uh, like that but uh, if some you know uh, uh, sense point has missed in between that it was may have some adverse effect so that uh, one has to look into that is the uh, drawback of this kind of sampling and the small sampling interval uh, if we are transmitting that reduces the error uh, but uh, that will increase the energy consumption so uh, we'll have to make a trade-off that uh, we have to use uh, less energy and uh, must have the least uh, sampling error so we can have this uh, uh, period changing from one uh, design to the another design 
and this real time sampling is the another uh, uh, real time monitoring uh, <clears throat> uh, applications so the crop grown in uh, critical weather conditions or highly dynamic environments may require real time monitoring so it requires a transmitter to be always in on stage to sample data hence it is not energy efficient so but if the crop is <clears throat> costlier and <clears throat> such uh, conditions are required then we may provide this condition so in threshold we can have another as the threshold <clears throat> we set one threshold and whenever the sampled value will go beyond that threshold then and only then we will transmit so that is uh, known as threshold or the level cross sampling so <clears throat> this data is communicated only one uh, <clears throat> So the data is transmitted only if uh, it crosses this alarm or this threshold. So um, this can be used for measuring the values of temperature, humidity, moisture, carbon dioxide concentration, and light intensity. And uh, there are uh, another one uh, that is Sandon Delta. That is another technique. In this case, what we find out is. Uh, the kind of the difference between the two sampled values and if that sampled value is within the range within that uh, delta range then we are not going to transmit that but else we can uh, let us see the another aspects So there are a few uh, which are summed up, uh, some of the reliable but less energy efficient and some the crop grown in critical weather conditions. So this is the real time or uh, the high dynamic environment is there may require real time monitoring. So there we can use this. So it requires the transistor to be always in the on state to sample data. Hence, uh, it is not the energy efficient that is uh, there. Then we have threshold level uh, cross, which is the prone to the sampling error because if we are transmitting at this point then after that point after that point but it it is sampling at all the points but it will transmit only when it will it crosses a threshold level so it may fail in case of the faulty sensor and uh, it is uh, more energy uh, efficient that is true but it suits for the less uh, dynamic uh, environments like uh, uh, greenhouse and the another is the sand on delta so this sampling technique can be made adaptive as per parameter value that the sample frequently in critical ranges of temperature, humidity, etc. So the trade-off between sampling error and energy consumption can be balanced in this case and adaptive multivariate sampling can be used. So in case of adaptive multivariate uh, sampling, the trade-off between power consumption and accuracy can be balanced by optimizing two levels, uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And this sandon delta, which has only one parameter that is the delta. So higher the delta, lesser the number of transmission because that will fall uh, within that range. So we need not to transmit all of the data. So uh, still, uh, you can say the loads of uh, work because once you sum up it all, uh, uh, according to the crop, one can find out that uh, how we can sample the data depending upon the position depending upon the uh, you can say uh, the area physical area in which the greenhouse is located now the multivate uh, sampling so it's the dynamic is the multivate sampling which has less number of transmissions than non multivate sampling uh, not suitable for the slowly changing uh, environment and this is the adaptive with the parameter so in this case we'll use the energy consumption is less then techniques having some transmission interval for all the parameters, uh, sending data of different parameters in separate packets that incurs additional energy wastage. So that was, uh, uh, you know, made adaptive with the, the parameter if you are transmitting, say, the temperature, we are transmitting, say, the humidity. So all, uh, each and every sensor will have their own uh, sampling uh, algorithm over there. And then we have PSDT, that is the uh, sampling with average delayed transmission. 
so that is another technique to deal with these trade off issues so data sampled over a longer duration is averaged and sent sent with a delay so this is the power efficiency yet accurate but reliable and psdt average overall uh, readings so data was periodically sampled and averaged over 10 10 readings so one can use uh, this kind of sampling and this is the sum up of all these parameters all these sampling uh, sampling techniques so once we use the number of uh, uh, transmissions because the more the number of transmissions more the energy is being consumed if we use the periodic sampling so there we have the number of transmission as uh, 17280 days for uh, five uh, seconds and if we use samples for a day for five minutes and edge for five hours like that then if we use threshold level cross then it depends on the changing environmental parameters how many times that the uh, <clears throat> parameter will cross that threshold level and then the number of transmissions can be calculated if it is not crossing that threshold uh, even once a day then there will be no transmission that will take place then we have the send on delta send on delta if we put in the value fixed as a 3%. So if the value falls within that uh, range of plus minus 3% or the plus minus 5%, accordingly, the number of uh, transmissions will vary. So if inside the temperature, it is 469 for 3%, then it will be 279 for within the 5% like that. So it is outside temperature, then 762, 353, then if it is humidity, uh, for uh, delta is 3%, 674, then for 5%, it will be 358. For the solar radiations, if 826, then it is 553. Wind speed is 5720 or 37, likewise. So it will change within uh, the parameter uh, depending upon the value of the delta. Then we had adaptive multi rate sampling. So for this, uh, we require say 18 number of transmissions for HS5 hours, and for this as 10, and for HS14. 18. So dynamic multi rate sampling, edges 5, 44, 10, and 14. So adaptive uh, with the parameter. So this is temperature, uh, the number of transmissions will be 8640 per day, air humidity that's many times per day, soil humidity that many times per day. So uh, soil pH 43200 uh, per day. So the number of transmissions will more. In case of adaptive with parameter so and different different parameter will transmit at different different times number of times then the psdt average over time then you can say it is a sample over two minutes then send average over 15 minutes so it can reduce the number of transmissions in a day 296 uh, per day and psdt averaged over readings then 72 per day then if, if it is sampled over two minutes and sent uh, average over 10 readings. That was the analysis done on the data for the eight days and then uh, units of the time interval, which are not clearly mentioned, can be assumed to be in minutes and data is for uh, alpha one to be 0.5 and alpha two to be 1.0 in the formula, which is used for the adaptive multi-rate. And uh, based on that analysis, we propose one of the variance adaptive sporadic sampling for the greenhouse monitoring. Uh, and uh, first, analyze this k and then send uh, the mean of this k values. This k is the number of samples. Then, they calculate the variance in of the k set of readings. And if this is less than certain value, then increase the k. It means <coughs> If the number of uh, readings we are having and uh, uh, uniformity is more, then we can increase that interval. If the uniformity is less, then we, we can decrease that uh, interval. So that is the main thing. If this is within the range, then we will increase this k and then we'll send the mean of this k value. So like if we have 10, uh, say, readings and uh, we transmit the average of that 10, but the variation is high. So if the variation is high, then we'll reduce that value from 10 to say 8 or 7 or 5. But the variation is uh, not there, then we'll increase that uh, from 10 to say 12 or 15 or 20. It means more uh, the times we are having the homogeneous data, 
then we'll uh, take average of more number of uh, samples than transmit. But if the fluctuation in data is there, that is uh, more uh, often occurring, then we'll uh, take the average of the less number of samples to communicate the true value of the readings. So that is uh, the proposed uh, algorithm over there. And then uh, if it is no, then uh, we'll increase or decrease the value of K. And uh, this is the one algorithm which is, uh, uh, you know, very soon will be published. And these uh, some of uh, the data collection units or the horizontal layouts uh, for taking the sampling or the sample the value of the humidity and temperature. And that was implemented on this algorithm and then this was carried out and the results were this is the threshold level cross and this is for PSDT and this is the number of transmissions which are required and this is send on delta and this adaptive multi-rate and this is uh, VS. So uh, this VS is proposed uh, by us. So you can see uh, in that case, because th that seems to be true as well, if we have more homogeneity in the data, we can take average of larger data. And if we, if we have less uh, homogeneity inside the data, then we can take uh, a less number of, uh, we, we can say the samples and then can transmit. And that was the energy consumption. So that is directly related with the, a number of transmissions that you can assume that if one uh, number of transmission consumes certain joules, then uh, how much joules will be you know, consumed uh, by transmitting those number of transmissions. So for all these, uh, if the number of transmissions are less for uh, VS, then it will be less uh, consumption of the energy as well. And these are uh, the standard deviations. If um, it is uh, uh, le less in case of larger uh, values can be averaged and if it is high then uh, less values uh, needs to be averaged. So then uh, we're checking the energy consumption for this and, and these are the number of uh, you know, samples at that time. Then we have the routing protocol. Uh, for that, if uh, if you want, we can take a, a break of uh, 10 minutes and then we can come up. Dr. Kundan? Yes, sir. So can we take a break now and uh, then we can resume after 10 minutes? Okay, okay, no issue, sir. Or we can take continue. No, sir, we can take a minute break. Okay, okay, so we'll have 10 so, minutes break. So yeah. In the meantime, you can also enjoy your tea. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, dear participant, this is a tea break for 10 minutes. So, we all are enjoying your home. Huh?
हेलो हेलो यस 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 आई एम बैक सर वीडियो इज नॉट कमिंग सर एक्चुअली वी हैव टेकन अ 10 मिनट ब्रेक सो नाउ वी विल स्टार्ट इन बिटवीन 2 एंड 3 मिनट्स ओके ओके दैट्स व्हाई ऑडियो इट वी कैन स्टार्ट डॉक्टर कुंदन कैन वी स्टार्ट नाउ यस ओके ओके वी स्टार्ट सर वी कैन स्टार्ट okay so we have reached to this uh, routing protocols the most of uh, work is being carried out on the routing protocols but uh, i have uh, you know included in this presentation which were used for the greenhouse environment so basically uh, there are uh, many routing algorithms but uh, 
uh, few of them are being used in the greenhouse environment. So we can say that still the, the scope that uh, more routing algorithms can be used. So these are the few that we'll discuss one by one. Uh, one is the location of the nodes, and these are some of you can see the parameters, uh, the environments that affect the design of uh, the routing protocol. So one is the location of the node. Since the target of the application is the plant or a crop, so the location of the node depends on the location of the crop. So that proposed a shadowing model for positioning of nodes in a tomato grade greenhouse. Other is the effect of environmental conditions. So the efficient operation of sensors is uh, affected by uh, different environmental conditions uh, like sunlight, temperature, humidity, etc. The effect of plant growth the crops planted in the greenhouses eventually grows and hinders the path of the trans receiver signal. So that is the most important part, which is uh, being ignored earlier by many researchers that they were initially installing the sensor and thereafter they were not changing the position. So since the uh, plant of the growth affects the trans receiver signal, so it is necessary to look into that aspect as well. And uh, we need to change the position of the sensor and or we need to change the path of the signal which is to be transmitted so the separate foliage models that are required for this purpose and this uh, another is the hybrid heterogeneous networks so greenhouses may be spread over hectares and the farmer may have acquisition of different greenhouses and each greenhouse may have different crop planted in it if constructed at separate uh, times, these greenhouses may have different communication platforms for operations of the sensor networks. So these are the few of the challenges, design challenges. And there are the routing protocols, which has been used otherwise uh, in uh, another uh, couple of networks also. Uh, this is a dynamic source routing. So this GAO at all in 2012 proposed to implement DSR for temperature and humidity monitoring. So it was based on basically the number of hops that was used as the routing parameter. And the maximum hop count was set to four and each node were 300 meters apart. So that was uh, the success using DSR. And there was the destination sequenced distance vector, DSDV routing. So this was also being implemented and uh, which has the high uh, control overhead and that was avoided for uh, using into the greenhouses that's uh, spread over hectares. Then optimized link state routing, OLSR, is a proactive routing protocol which works on concept of maintaining a route before using it and it was completed by Lou et al. And then ad hoc on-demand distance vector routing and its variants. So the source node sends the RRAQ packets to discover route and RRAQ packets contain destination address. These packets are flooded into the network. Whenever a neighbor receives RRAQ, it checks it. They are uh, the destination. If yes, then RRAQ packet is sent back to the source. This is done by a bus at all. And that proposed uh, falsification to improve reliability of AODB protocol. It also proposed protocols that perform better for mobile environment. Similarly, another researcher has also proposed to integrate ant colony optimization with AODB to improve packet delivery ratio, delay, lifetime, and the throughput. So depending upon these uh, performance parameters like uh, uh, the packet delivery ratio, throughput, and lifetime, uh, many uh, more routing protocols can also be implemented in the greenhouses. And this is the routing protocol for low power uh, lossy networks and its variants. And, uh, that uh, Sejo Orchid uh, suggested using RPL, uh, that, that is the routing protocol for low power and lossy uh, network uh, protocol for routing of the packets in a cassava greenhouse monitoring system. Nodes were placed in uh, layer tessellations. And uh, once we place them into the layer tessellations, it means we are covering the entire area. We're not leaving any of the area either in the overlap or leaving any area which is not having the coverage. So Chan et al. Uh, discusses the role of RPL protocol in precision agriculture. And then Quen et al. Uh, proposed a multipath variant of RPL protocol for greenhouse monitoring. Uh, the three uh, variants of RPL were suggested to cope up with the path failure and the load balancing issues in the multipath scenario. Energy awareness, load balancing, uh, the faster local repair and the ELB FLR. 
and there are another routing protocols which are being reported to be used in the greenhouses. That ULHL proposed a three level based routing for melon and the cabbage greenhouses. Nodes at the same tree level have the same number of hops to sync. The proposed system assigns few nodes to be uh, to be parents, while other sectors children children choose to choose join the parent according to a pre decided metric. Authors implemented uh, largest RSSI as a decided metric. Kang et al. in 2007 proposed to implement uh, gossiping for uh, routing of the data packets and directed def diffusion for the control packets. And uh, so the many other protocols were also being proposed. So there is another one which we implemented that is the one which is the link state in conjunction with the distance vector based routing. So these routing protocols evolved so far for conventional wireless sensing networks that can't be generalized to greenhouse environments because the greenhouse setup has its own constraints like effect of the crop growth, effect of the environment conditions on the census performance, etc. So the most of the available deployments in the literature implements Zigbee as the trans receiver, considering it to be cost effective and the as it accepts AODV as a routing protocol with no uh, deliberations of conditions and scenario based optimization. Link state is more appropriate phenomena as route selection. Link state is conjunction with distance vector can be implemented for agricultural environment considering path loss. So total path loss we can calculate that, that is uh, propagation loss plus vegetation loss. This is the formula for the propagation loss, the attenuation of the propagated signal between the trans receiver antenna that can be used to uh, compute the received signal strength, RSS uh, values, uh, the free space path loss uh, model that uh, are given by the you know in the book as the report, and, uh, uh, the two-ray ground reflection model that gives a certain value, long distance model that also gives uh, this formula. How do we calculate? Uh, the mostly it is uh, what is the uh, radiative power uh, near the node and uh, after some distance. It is uh, being the ratio of that. So this is the propagation loss. So when signal uh, propagates near the ground, two-ray ground reflection model provides good fit for the propagation loss, then FSPL, uh, but both models perform good for the outdoor uh, unobstructed environment and seems over optimistic for indoor uh, obstructed environments like greenhouses. The greenhouse environment is compared, uh, composed of various factors such as reflection, diffraction, and scattering which are not considered precisely by these models. In addition, the two-ray model considers only main and reflected rays, um, whereas the greenhouse environment involves multipath rays. Uh, the log distance path loss model provides a good fit to the major path loss in vegetative environments. So what we can conclude from there that uh, there is no specific model which is proposed uh, for the uh, greenhouse environment. Uh, we have uh, indoor environment propagation model and outdoor environment propagation model. Uh, some of uh, we have studied the Hatha model for uh, cellular communications as well. Uh, but if you we'll look to particularly for the uh, inside or indoor uh, uh, propagation model for the greenhouses that is uh, yet to uh, come up and one can look into that aspect also. Polyas loss, uh, vegetation loss, that is an, um, another part that is because of the uh, crops that uh, are given by Rogers at all in 2012 that ABC can be empirically compounded as A into F raised to power B into D raised to power C. The A value is determined based on the foliage type and the B and C uh, values represent the frequency and the distance uh, dependencies respectively. And then Westberger's modified exponential decay model. So what we uh, come over, uh, across there is that uh, there, there is certain model uh, which uh, gives this uh, kind of loss and uh, the total loss that we calculate is uh, that is the propagation loss plus this vegetation loss. And based on that uh, uh, loss, uh, propagation loss, uh, we uh, implemented one uh, link state in conjunction with distance vector based routing uh, that was implemented. And this is the, the first part was the choose layout parameters for this uh, simplest as the grid based model was choose. Then they calculate the sortest path on the basis of the distance vector. Then uh, the path loss is calculated for the sortest path. And then we are selecting the route after replacing the matrix. And then after each iteration, the route selection is being done. So this is for the 15 number of nodes. And uh, one to two is source to sync, and <laughs> average nodes that is 250. Then you can say uh, shortest path uh, with the seven number of hops was to 41 to 23. So uh, that was being calculated based on that formula. 
and dead node is uh, 26, which will be reflected in the next that is uh, being considered randomly. So then the next dead node will be 41, and uh, that will be using the iteration. And this uh, number of ops is seven from one to 41 to 23 to 44, like that. So from there, uh, uh, the number of ops eight. As the number of dead nodes will increase, so we can have the more number of hops as well. Either we increase the range or the number of hops will increase. So each time it can give an effective uh, routing protocol. That was another one. And the number of packets sent as uh, 11,259. The number of hops is eight. So, when uh, these number of nodes will go on dying, then there will be a new route which is being selected. So from there we can calculate, this is uh, intermediate uh, calculations. And then we can have its network lifetime and another parameter that can be uh, calculated. And uh, one uh, based on the hybrid model, uh, uh, for the uh, propagation loss as well as the distance as well as um, <clears throat> the growth of the crop and the type of the crop uh, the routing protocols can be calculated then we have a very um, review you can say the kind of the communication technology which are being used um, in the greenhouses which i proposed these sensors needs to communicate to set the sense data to control the center the connectivity in typical greenhouses is required among sensors and the sensors to gateway to a base station, that is true. And the communication in the greenhouse has its own constraints like growth of the crops, environment effects, etc. So these are the few techniques uh, which are being used. So Jigbee is the most, as you see the number which we have cited as the largest. The Jigbee has uh, found the place which is higher than any other. So we have Jigbee, we have GPRS, we have, this is a new one, this is a long range. And uh, for uh, open field, we can say this is being best suited. And uh, then we have Wi-Fi that can be implemented, Bluetooth for the smaller distances. And one other is extreme RF model, but most of them are play, plug and play kind of techniques which are being used. And at least uh, they are used a few times inside the greenhouses. So the, the, then at all use GPRS, and those centers use LORA. And in, in, no doubt it was a large greenhouse, but uh, a larger distance was to be covered. So each one have certain advantages uh, one in terms of the higher uh, data rate or in terms of the range likewise. So one can use uh, one of the technique uh, suiting to its, uh, uh, what you call that as uh, environment and the area of the greenhouse or the type of crop we are going to use a number of nodes like that. So this is uh, just the a brief introduction of each. This is the Jigbee. So as you know, the idea of Jigbee floated in 1990s, but I'm not going to the details. This is the operators in 2.4 gigahertz uh, is based on IEEE 802.15. So Jigbee, three types of devices identified Jigbee and, uh, and devices, Jigbee routers and Jigbee coordinators. So uh, as we see, very less time is left, so we'll not uh, go into the details of this. Then we have GPRS, which is uh, General Packet Radio Service. So GPRS was standardized by European Telecommunications Standard Institute, which was launched in 2000. And in a uh, packet-based uh, service for GSM devices. So it, it does not have a range limitation, but it was being used by uh, uh, some researchers to send regular uh, alerts on the farmer's phone. Then the Wi-Fi uh, uh, stands for wireless fidelity based on IEEE 802.11, you're already familiar with, as uh, it has a communication range of 20 to 100 meters. So Wi-Fi network has an access point through which all the devices communicates. Then we have long range, so long range LORA, is another communication enabling technology for agriculture that is being used for the open field more frequently, but uh, in uh, limited uh, applications for the uh, greenhouses. So it was developed by a group of companies called Toro Alliance in 2017. It is owned by Sentech Corporation California. 
this law has uh, long range in kilometers and low power consumption so it helps in deploying lp uh, you can say low power wide area networks and uh, that is a network based on this technology and the gateway receive the data from low end devices and direct it to the lower servers so basically in this case the chip modulation is being used that is a spread spectrum there is a spectrum uh, spreading factor and the uh, data rate and uh, the number of hopes that is uh, the, the bandwidth consumption that is dependent on the spreading rate like that and uh, it executes the unlicensed uh, band like uh, 169 megahertz or 868 megahertz or 433 megahertz so implementation using unlicensed bands does not need any permission but are vulnerable to interference right uh, due to its long range log can support remote monitoring applications like greenhouse monitoring if we are uh, remotely monitoring it and then some of the researchers like Rec et al. suggested implementing LoRa for greenhouse so it can handle thousands of nodes and can communicate over wide range. It can communicate over distances. So uh, this is basically uh, that uh, uh, we can use it, but uh, if we argue that uh, Jigbee can handle very few hundreds of nodes, LoRa can also be deployed for greenhouse spread over hectares. We can uh, have Bluetooth that is already known. Extreme is also there, which is a long range radio communication module which can transmit in the range of five to 16 kilometers. Central processing station of this uh, extreme is an application on PC, which can connect to the extreme uh, modem using USB. Then the plan point in 2018 uh, proposed using extreme uh, proprietary RF radio frequency modem for communication between coordinator gateway and the control station. And there are another techniques also, which are being used. Uh, this commonly used technology, there are a few wireless technologies uh, in the WSN environment in full projects to increase the speed and the reliability. LAN can also be used to send data to the base station, whereas sensors still communicate wirelessly. So that can that combination can also be come up. It's a kind of hybrid system, which uh, Bankusha and uh, Bus 2006, uh, a controlled area network a based wired bus is also another option for the greenhouse that was so uh, we can uh, go through the comparison uh, in brief that uh, yeah, it, uh, the simulations were in the MATLAB. Uh, in the Zigbee, that range is 10 to 20 meters, frequency band uh, 2.6 gigahertz, network size that is more important, 65,000 nodes per network cost is low. The data rate uh, you can achieve is 22 to 50 kilobits per second. Power consumption is low communication is peer-to-peer. -peer. Then we have GPRS. Jigbee is mostly used, so we also use Jigbee. GPRS in range of mobile network area, which is licensed, which is from 900 to 1800 MHz. Um, then 1000 nodes per network can be used. Uh, cost is high. Data rate is uh, 56 to 114 kilobits per second. Power consumption is high. So base station to device it can be used. Wi-Fi is 20 to 100 meters uh, in a licensed band 2.4 gigahertz, 32 nodes per network. Cost is high. Data rate can be 2 to 54 gigabits per second. And the power consumption is high and it can provide access point to the device. The LOR is 10 kilometers plus. I think the high range, highest of among all which are available. Uh, works in the three unlicensed band of 169 megahertz, 868 megahertz. 433 megahertz and 10,000 nodes per uh, gateway can be used. So it can handle the large network size as well. The cost is moderate and the data is, is from very, uh, it is, is low from 0 0.3 to 50 kilobits per second. Power consumption is low and it can act as a peer to peer communication. Then the Bluetooth, which is known, 1 to 100 meters, depending upon the class of the Bluetooth we are using, the memory license band, eight nodes per Ethernet. Uh, cost is low. Then data rate is one to three uh, Mbps. Uh, power consumption is moderate, and it can act in the master slave and the peer to peer communication. Then the extreme is also find some of uh, it's, uh, an application. The greenhouse its range is five to sixteen kilometer. Frequency band is two point four gigahertz. Then it can access seven channels, each with sixty five thousand addresses. So it can also handle a large number of uh, nodes. Cost is low. Data rate is 10 to 20 kilobits per second. Power consumption is low. It has peer-to-peer -peer communication. So among all those, uh, I still see the Zigbee finds its on uh, placement in this range. As long as data rate is concerned and uh, uh, the range is concerned. So once we install inside, that can be done. But 
depending upon the other requirements, one can go for other type of technologies as well. Then we have certain prediction models in greenhouses. These prediction models are being made for the disease prediction and, and uh, for the prediction of um, uh, you know, the sample data as well. So uh, some are the prediction on the basis of the parameters and some predict uh, on the basis of the previous data, some regression based prediction models. So the, some of them uh, have the prediction on the basis of the sample. Instead of transmitting the actual sense value, they can transmit the predicted value as well. So we'll not go into the much details of this. Then we have uh, fusion in the fuzzy logic uh, for the disease prediction. That is the one area uh, which is uh, still the open area. One can go for it and in conclusion we have among various layout techniques we can see the grid is the simplest and the suits for the small greenhouses isolation of the topology of sensors and the routers which prolongs the network lifetime and manages the risk then choosing the appropriate sampling technique can help in balancing trade-off between accuracy and energy consumption zigbee is the most widely used for the communication among sensors in greenhouses and the predictive models uh, modeling can aid in disease forecasting, uh, this finding relations and measuring the values for the parameters for which sensors are not uh, available. And uh, predictive modeling can also help for the disease forecasting. And this um, artificial intelligence uh, on the disease forecasting uh, is still an open area in this case, and one can work. Uh, on this and uh, as you see once we uh, started work on this area we found that very less uh, publications were available in IEEE, Springer and elsewhere but from 2010 onwards there was uh, exponential increase in the number of papers which are uh, in the agriculture field but still very uh, less papers you can say has been published in the area of WSN greenhouse so still uh, WSN greenhouse uh, is in the area for the academic purposes, one can have uh, more uh, publications um, in this side as well. These are uh, the references and I will show you the digital Kisan uh, two or three videos and then we uh, take up your discussion part. Uh, let me show you how to connect uh, directly with the public like this. Basically, this is the uh, uh, video that was uh, for, for the, you can say, awareness or for giving the information to the farmers, how you can uh, apply. And uh, another one will show, which is related to
so this is uh, one of the video by this professor who has uh, uh, grown this mushroom and uh, inside a small uh, what you call that as a poly house which is uh, low cost poly house then we had uh, one more if that audio is clear to you then we can start.
No. Yes, yes. I know in the last two videos uh, that was not proper, but that was done by you know uh, our students only who worked for uh, two or three months and they did uh, uh, searched who uh, uh, is working in this field and uh, taking advantage of the best practices shared uh, you know created these videos shared these videos and uploaded these videos on the digital kana kisan if you uh, search on the facebook that is still there although our project uh, uh, completed last year and we handed over all these rights to the Uh, department of agriculture and farmers welfare um, government of haryana and now they are uh, taking uh, looking after it they are taking care of it. 